Genau. What's your name? Sonatata. Oh, Sonatata. So when is your uh, first time three sets? Actually, the dates have not come yet. Okay. Please sit, relax. There also, take your body back a little. Sit, relax with your back to the back of the chair. There also, you should sit like this only. You understand? Huh? There's nothing to worry about it. You feel better. So, uh, we'll start. Can you tell us something about yourself? Uh, my name is Natasha Goy. Um, I am a student of Tintasya Gardens. Uh, I am uh, preparing for the civil services for the last three years. I belong to Punjab Dekhana. And uh, uh, my interests are diary writing and passive in meditation. Okay. So, what kind of a meditation you do? So, I practice Sudarshan Kriya, which is a meditation technique taught by the art of living organization. Okay. So, and what do you learn in that? How is Sudarshan Kriya done? Uh, so, it is a breathing technique. Uh, with, uh, firstly, uh, we do a three-stage pranayam and then followed by Sastrika. And then some uh, rhythmic breathing, uh, which helps to calm the mind eventually. And it helps you really? Yes, sir. And it helps I have you? really benefited from it. Okay. Mike, please uh, keep the mic closer. So I'm sure you're reading the newspapers. Have you read today's newspaper? Uh, so I glanced through the front page. Front page. Which yes, newspaper? I said the Indian Express. So Prime Minister said something about freebies today. <coughs> Tell me what, what has he said? Uh, so he was basically saying that the political parties, they are uh, putting, uh, they are not really uh, paying much attention to the financial process and uh, they are uh, exceeding the expenditure. Uh, more than the income of uh, uh, more than the income uh, which is allowed, so that is spoiling the political culture of the country. So, what is your view? Uh, sir, freebies in itself, uh, there should be some sort of uh, uh, mechanism which should be there in the country. Uh, freebies in itself are th not really bad in the sense that uh, the purpose for which the freebies is given. Uh, there are a large number of people who are below the poverty line in the country. So, uh, but at the same time, uh, the manner in which the freebies are being given, it is uh, really a pressure on the state exchequer, on the financial uh, condition. No, no, but <coughs> it's not clear to me. So you said freebies should not be there, then you say they themselves not bad. Well, first, let us define what are freebies the Prime Minister is referring to. So freebies are basically uh, uh, some uh, things which are said by the political parties, which they will they promise to the uh, voters that once they come to power, they will be giving those to the voters. For example, free electricity or mm. free transportation cards. So mm. uh, and they are basically for uh, there is no compartmentalization uh, when it comes to so delivery. Are you things. saying that there should be compartmentalization? Some must be given, some must not be given? Yes, okay. there should be better targeting. So, so which one should be given according to you? Uh, so those who are really in need of that particular benefit, they should be given. Like for example, let's say, let's say poor uh, rural areas in Ludhiana, mm -hmm. which should come from that place. So what are the freebies which are essential and which, which are the ones which are non-essential? Uh, so in uh, rural Ludhiana, I would say, for example, um, in terms of electricity, if we come, so there are certain households which are below the poverty line and which cannot afford to uh, even uh, afford their own food. They are maybe uh, <coughs> uh, peasants who are working on someone else's land. So they can be probably uh, given the free electricity benefits to an extent. And uh, even in terms of free uh, transportation, if we say, uh, mm -hmm. for the women, so even for women, I think it's an empowering measure to give a free transportation but card. Another them. issue which is being discussed these days very hotly is the Uniform Civil Code. Yes. Are you aware some states are going ahead with uh, bills and acts? Yes. Can you tell me which states? So I remember one which is Uttarakhand. It has formed a committee for that. Mm -hmm. Any other state is thinking of that? So so from the newspaper? If I can uh, make a guess, it is Madhya Pradesh. I'm not very sure about it. Okay. 
So what is your view about this UCC? Uh, sir, Uniform Civil Code, uh, even though the constitutional directive principles, they in Article 44, they say that there should be a Uniform Civil Code. But uh, as per my opinion, it should be after a more consensus-oriented measure, not a top-down imposed measure. So there should be a consensus which should be built first among the communities, uh, be it the Muslim community or the Christian community, and then a measure should be reached. It should be a bottom-up. No, but Christian community, there is no issue. <coughs> Basically, what you are referring to the Muslim community. But tell me, if consensus doesn't happen for another 30 years, mm -hmm. so we'll wait? Uh, or should we wait? Uh, sir, I would go with the view of uh, uh, Professor Nivedita Menon and Flavia Agnes in this regard. They say that even though if a consensus is not reached, then there should be reforms within the personal laws first. And it should be uh, brought from the community itself. For example, even in the Muslim personal laws. So, supposing they don't do that, I'm just a theoretical thing, then what happens? Uh, sir, um, then also uh, there should be a gradual approach which should be followed. It should not be a uh, top down and in a uh, overnight approach. It should be a gradual based on consensus, even though it But we have waited. You yourself said there is a provision in the Constitution of India in the Directive Principles, mm -hmm. and it's more than 70 years already. Yes. So how long you think we should wait more? Sir, it should be a gradual approach. Even if it takes another 50 years, 60 years, it should be a bottom-up approach based on consensus. It should not be a top-down approach because in any case, it will create more frictions uh, because uh, we are a heterogeneous society, we are a multi-ethnic society, anything, everything should be based on consensus after following a democratic approach, after following a proper deliberative approach. Thank you. My colleagues will talk to you now. Thanks. <coughs> Just go ahead. Uh, have you heard about the uh, draft data protection bill? Uh, sir, not completely, but uh, a bit of it, yes. What does it uh, replace any preceding act? Uh, sir, not any preceding act, but there was a bill uh, which was uh, proposed initially and uh, it reached the joint parliamentary committee, if I am correct, uh, but then it uh, was revoked back and now another bill has been proposed after uh, uh, there was also a BN Shri Krishna committee on the same uh, purpose, on the same issue. So it's a draft at the moment. When is it likely to be introduced? Parliament? So I am not sure about it. Okay, tell me uh, some of the fundamentals, fundamentals in the draft <coughs> on how personal data should be handled. Uh, so some of the, the broad fundamentals, what does the draft propose? So there is a provision of consent, first of all, from the side of the uh, person who is... It's informed consent. Yes, sir. What is informed consent? So informed consent is when the person who is uh, parting with his data, uh, he is informed about uh, where the data will be utilized and how it will be utilized. A broad measure that, okay, his data is being taken and he is ready to give that data. Can he withdraw his consent? Uh, so as per the bill, uh, I think there is a provision to withdraw the consent also. How does he withdraw consent? You know, you look at uh, these uh, uh, <coughs> social media sites, big meta sites. Uh, before you can download the app, they ask you to, whether you accept the terms and conditions, and they are so large. No one really goes through them. Yes. So is it uh, informed consent then? Is it possible? to have informed consent? Sir, in this regard, in the present bill, there is a provision of uh, providing those instructions in a multilingual format, in the vernacular format. But even then, they run into pages. Uh, sir, I'm not sure about it. Maybe uh, it is. I'm not really sure about it, sir. OK. <coughs> is there a liability for uh, the companies or the apps for misusing data? Yes, sir. There is a monetary penalty. Uh, if I'm correct, it is around 6,000 crores or something they have to pay as a penalty. But there is a financial penalty, that is for sure. Is there a uh, of criminal offense also made out? Sir, it was there in the initial bill, but in the present bill, it is not there. Okay, so what is your overarching view of this draft? 
um, protection bill. Do you think it will really protect uh, personal information? Look at AIMS, the entire files have been, personal data has been uh, taken away. Yes. You know, can the bill protect in such a scenario? Uh, sir, a very uh, con um, contentious provision in the bill is the blanket exemption which is being given to the government agencies for the use of data. And uh, in terms of when it comes to the uh, companies, the big tech companies, about the provisions related to the big tech companies and the provisions related to the individual consumer, uh, they are more or less at par at the current stage. But the blanket exemption which is given to the government agencies that is somewhere where uh, more rethink needs to be given to the... Is that people. controversial in your opinion? Uh, so blanket <coughs> provision is not really uh, in favor of the individual's right to privacy, which is under the Puttuswami judgment. But who will protect the individual's rights? If the companies uh, fail, then it is the government which should, which should protect it. So the government should have powers, should have authority. Mm -hmm. That is why the blanket provision for the government. So there is also a blanket provision to the government exemption uh, with, re you, uh, with respect to the collection of data and the use of data. That is somewhere where there needs to be a check even on the government agencies to uh, prevent the misuse of data by the uh, party which is in the ruling dispensation. There is also a Digital India Bill. Digital India Bill which will replace the IT Act. Are you aware of this bill? No, sir, I am not aware. No? No, sir. Okay. Okay, my final question. You are from Ludhiana, Punjab. Tell me about the drug situation in Punjab. Uh, sir, currently the drug situation is uh, not in a good uh, <coughs> framework. There are youngsters who are getting addicted to the drug. No, drugs. Please quantify because this is very, these are very general statements. Is the situation bad? Is it, is, is, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? So it is getting a bit worse, considering the cross-border drones which are being used. How, how do you say that it is getting worse? Do you have any data? Um, no, sir. I do not have any data about and it. And how can you say it's getting worse? Because of the uh, use of uh, drones, which is uh, being uh, in intercepted by the BSF every now and then. And also after the situation in Afghanistan, where the Taliban has taken over, and uh, there is completely uh, law and order is because the economy now initially Afghanistan economy was a bit dependent on the donors. Now we're talking about Punjab. Yes sir. Afghanistan I can understand from Afghanistan it goes everywhere in the, in the world including Pakistan. In Pakistan it comes here and there are various methods of uh, trafficking including drones. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what are the drugs of choice for an addict? Which drugs does he use? Uh, so one or two, uh, one would be heroin, which is uh, used. Another is the whitener, which is used by the young children. What is heroin called locally in Punjab? I'm not aware of Chitta? I think so. Okay, what are the other drugs? Heroin is one. Um, so I'm not aware about it. Pharmaceuticals, can they be abused? Cough syrups, they can be used. Only cough syrups? So I'm aware about only the cough syrups. Okay, how do you, because I'm telling you Punjab, the problem is quite serious mm -hmm. and it is not getting better. Uh, large number of youth, you know, have fallen prey to it. So what is the solution? Of course, there is law enforcement, mm -hmm. better interdiction from across the border. But is that enough? No, sir, that is not enough because uh, even at the end of the day, the government has limitations. Uh, there needs to be citizen empowerment. That is the most important and the most pertinent uh, step which needs to be what taken. What do you mean by citizen empowerment in terms of drugs? No, sir. In terms of uh, more rehabilitation centers and even uh, more counseling sessions for the parents and for the drug addict. Because eventually, even the drug addict is a victim. He is also fighting with his own limitations. And eventually, the family is the worst sufferer in any case. So uh, looking at the victim, uh, looking at the drug addict as a victim, rather than as a person <coughs> who is uh, intentionally doing it, uh, that is the first step. 
so uh, counseling for the parents is needed and also for the rehabilitation centers there needs to be proper infrastructure and more awareness about it recently there was a case of a woman uh, who was uh, there was a video taken she was uh, into uh, uh, under the impression of the drugs she had taken uh, recently so uh, one very uh, major issue is that there is a stigma attached to the women addicts that needs to be taken away because even the women they are getting into addiction and because considering the patriarchal setup which is there in punjab so uh, addiction about women does not come to the surface that is the very very important step which needs to be taken so thank more, you thank thanks. you mr tarsha you talked about afghanistan you talked about the law and order situation there you discussed drugs you talked about women i have some questions for you First of all, do you think Afghanistan will, under the Taliban, give due respect and importance to women? Sir, till now they have not given. So, what is your opinion? Will it? Will they do so, in course of time? Uh, sir, it looks the chances are bleak for that. Now, drugs. Afghanistan was a major drug producer. and do you think there are indications that it is again becoming a major drug producer yes sir so what can be done to check that uh sir uh, since the initially the afghan economy was largely based on the donors funds now that has stopped so the only fallback option the major fallback option is the opium production so um internally any doing anything would be a difficult task global cooperation would be needed at the level of un at the level of other international agencies the countries will need to come together what do you think should be india's policy towards afghanistan sir india's policy initially we were not in favor of talking with the taliban but now considering that they are in power and they will remain in power india needs to have words india needs to move with diplomacy india you think needs to have a dialogue going with afghanistan so a uh, dialogue would be needed with the taliban because they will be in power but do you think that will uh, not bestow a certain amount of legitimacy to the taliban government despite its repressive policies towards women what is your view on that uh so uh, when it comes to legitimacy there are already questions but then there are other countries who have already bestowed their legitimacy to the taliban government for example china and russia so uh, when it comes to the international uh, political scenario pragmatism is the ethical policy so considering pragmatism <coughs> india needs to have a dialogue because taliban will remain in power and uh, if uh, when it comes to the situation of their uh, behavior towards women uh, there needs to be international cooperation and there needs to be sanctions on that particular aspect until they do recognize that if we continue to behave like this there will be repercussions you referred to china what are china's interest in afghanistan uh, so afghanistan has a lot of rare earth metals and china is an emerging economy china is already uh, challenging us when it comes to economy and other uh, spheres so there are the rare earth metals which are there in afghanistan and other minerals china is basically eyeing towards that also there is a bri project by china and uh, if Afga uh, china has afghanistan in its favor it will uh, give a boost to its own bri project the belt and road initiative do you think that uh, the afghans can become a problem for china vis-a-vis -vis its western province vis-a-vis -vis the chinese muslims who are settled in the western part of china do you think afghanistan can create some problems there so there can be some problems considering the very orthodox uh, mindset of the taliban the regressive mindset so in the xinjiang region with the uighur muslims there can be some problems and i think that is one of another reason why china is in talks with taliban at a very proactive stage because it cannot really trust pakistan with respect to its afghanistan policy so yes that is one of the reason uh you talked about trusting pakistan does china trust pakistan as such uh so international in international politics no nations uh, trust another nation it's only about national interest and considering the situation in uh, uh, pakistan itself the instability in politics uh, i think uh, even china is looking at pakistan from a very pragmatic view rather than a 
Very Natasha, you said in international relations, no nation trusts another. Yes. Is that really true? Uh, or do you think that's an exaggeration? Uh, so, uh, if um, saying that no nation trusts another nation is that uh, national interest always comes as a priority. So, even if uh, if trusting another nation, if it, there's a choice between trusting a nation and securing a national interest, nations go for securing national interest. Can you secure national interest by working with other nations? Yes, sir. And if you have to work with other nations, don't you have to have a certain degree of trust in them? Yes, sir. So, do you think Indian foreign policy, and you have been a student of Indian foreign policy and the theory of international relations, do you think that uh, Indian foreign policy as it is conceived today, designed today, is taking care of our national interests? Definitely, sir. Can you give me some uh, points in that regard? Why do you think? Uh, sir, um the current India's foreign policy stands on uh, strategic autonomy. So, uh, for example, India is part uh, currently a part of many multilateral organizations. So, on the one side, we are also cooperating with the US when it comes to Quad or when it comes to IPAF. And at the same time, we are cooperating with China and Russia uh, when it comes to SCO, when it comes to other uh, projects um, uh, uh, at the stage of UN and WTO on reformed multilateralism. So one is this multi-vector foreign policy which is being followed by India. Another very recent example is India's <coughs> decision to import oil from Russia. So that was a very strong step and a very, uh, very pertinent step considering the inflation, important inflation which Indian economy is facing because of the oil crisis and also considering the pressure from the West uh, that you have to choose one, either us or them. And in that sense, India's stand, that we are standing on our ground, is a very uh, strong step. My last question. One of your hobbies and interests is meditation. Do you think that meditation should be taught to school children from an early age? What is your view? Yes. And sir. why? Because uh, uh, meditation for me personally, it has helped me to relax. Uh, from the everyday stressful situations. Uh, meditation is that 20, 30 minutes which help me to cut back from all the activities and be with myself and have a bit, little bit of time with myself. And when a person is sitting with herself and having a time with, there is more clarity of thought. There is, uh, when, we, we, when we attend to the internal dialogue, the conflicts inside, there is more clarity of thought and uh, we are able to stand our, on our own grounds. And considering the peer pressure today, the intense competition today which there is, it is very important for the students to be taught Thank this. you. Thank you, sir. Okay, Miss Natasha. <coughs> you said that meditation is essential to reduce the stress in society or in the individual. So, if you can put it the uh, other way around, why can't we reduce the stress rather than preaching medicine, meditation? Uh, sir, uh, stress is basically when a person has a lot of work to do, but a very less time to do or very less energy to do. And considering the time, the information society which we are living in, there is going to be, uh, even if not the work, but the pace at which the world is moving, that is going, growing exponentially. So, uh, reducing the stress, meditation is a technique to handle that stress. So first creating the stress in the system, world or even in the country, stress can be because of unemployment, stress can be because of other serious reasons, maybe inflation. Then <coughs> rather than tackling those things and we start, it is something like rather than taking protective measures like in case of health, preventive measures, you are prescribing more of a cure. Mm -hmm. So cure oriented uh, approach is costly or more expensive as well. What do you think about it? Sir, uh, practicing meditation uh, is not antithetical to material progress. 
which is not antithetical to going forward for your job or going forward for other pursuits of life. Meditation is just a very uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes thing which you do for yourself. So uh, considering it as opposite to a material progress is I think where we falter. It is something which is complementary to that. So I didn't say it is against the material advancement. Mm -hmm. I only said that uh, this meditation is a curative step. Why can't we preventive step? That means prevent those things which cause stress. Uh, sir, then even uh, for a person who is in a very good job, if we say that it's a preventive step, uh, taken as a curative step, so I think even for a person who is in a very good job, who is earning a good amount of salary per month and who is in the peak of every stage in life, even that person would need this particular thing. Okay, now tell me, what is your view on the quality of politics in India? You are a student of political science. Um, so in terms of uh, democracy, uh, there is a certain degradation when it comes to the functioning of the parliament currently. Uh, the forum, parliament is a forum of debate. There is a certain depreciation which is seen because of the lack of opposition today and lack of internal party politics. So that is a very big uh, uh, loophole which is there in the current political scenario in India. Okay, and what is your opinion on now again the, there is a news that uh, Farmers from Punjab and Haryana, they are marching towards the Tikri border and they want a discussion, on, among themselves a discussion on MSP. Mm -hmm. Because government promised to make some committee on MSP. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on that? Whether MSP should be made a legal right or not? So MSP cannot be made a legal right because uh, it will cause an extreme burden on the financial uh, situation of the country. It cannot be legalized. Okay. And, uh, <coughs> you know, there are two parallel things going on. One in Iran, there is a ban on not wearing, or you can say that there is a restriction that uh, to the women that they should wear hijab in public. Mm -hmm. Whereas in India, hijab wearing is uh, not tolerated in uh, schools like in Karnataka situation, you must be knowing. So these, why these two opposite things? What do you think uh, women empowerment is by removing hijab or by insisting on putting or uh, wearing hijab? Or for that matter, any, anything like that? There are other, other symbols also. So my view would be that women empowerment is through a route where it is her decision to whether wear the hijab or not wear the hijab. It is not somebody else telling her that you should do this or you should not do this. It should be her own choice and that should be respected. So in that way, Iran, they don't want to wear. So that is wrong thing on the part of the government. Whereas in India, they want to wear and they are not allowed to wear, particularly in the college, schools, etc. So both are doing wrong things, even though both are doing opposite things. Sir, so when it comes to Iran, so the protest is coming from the women itself. So that decision should be respected by the state. Yeah. If the women do not want to wear it, that they should be given a co-head with that. Considering the situation in Karnataka, yeah. considering the schools are a very secular institution, there is a proper dress code which needs to be followed. So in that case, uh, the provision of the uh, uh, schools, that should be followed. The laws of the schools should be followed within the secular space of the institution. But if it is a secular and we have prayers in the school, which are not of secular nature. What is your opinion about it? Uh, so even in that, there is a constitutional provision uh, that uh, if the guardian has consented for the prayers and so uh, according to that, uh, the norms should be followed according to the constitution norms. Okay, last question. Now, sustainable development goals are there. Where does India stand in that? So I'm not really sure about the numbers, uh, but then yes, after the COVID pandemic, there has been a very re uh, regressive uh, regression on the uh, developmental goals which India was uh, moving towards. Can you name one or two? So in terms of education, there has been a lot of uh, students who are now out of schools. 
because of various socio-economic factors. For example, some have to join their parents to earn the livelihoods because of uh, the poverty in which the family has been drowned and uh, also because of the uh, uh, digital apartheid which was there. So after a disconnect of two years, now the children are finding it difficult to get back to their studies. What was the goal regarding education? Um, so it was, uh, I think, SDG goal number four, uh, education for all. That is all I remember, sir. And meeting by which time? So it was 2030. SDG okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Dasha, <coughs> can you tell us something about the demography of Ljubljana, please? So I'm only able to recall one, which is 75% of literacy is there uh, in the Ludhiana. Yes. Sir. Doesn't matter. Now about uh, Punjab, they say paddy cultivation, you know, has uh, depleted the underground water quite a lot. What's your view? Should it continue? Because farmers want to continue with it. Mm -hmm. Should it continue? If not, then what steps should be taken to stop it? So paddy cultivation cannot be stopped overnight, first of all, because it will have serious implications on the food security of the country. So before farmers, food security... In country, right? So many countries produce paddy. The entire Eastern India, the entire Southern India produces paddy. So it's more because of MSP that they get, I think. No? Yes, sir. So even uh, then, uh, Punjab is a very major producer of rice and India is also a major exporter of rice. Mm -hmm. So even in terms of food security and even in terms of the foreign earnings which India is doing. And uh, MSP is a very big reason because uh, uh, if so the... What is the solution? Are you suggesting that Punjab should continue with paddy cultivation? So in then what happens to the underground water? So it is not a sustainable solution from the present perspective. So I'm asking you, what is the solution according to you? So one solution could be that promising more MSP for the alternative crops, for example, millets, which are more socio-economically suitable for the climate of the uh, uh, that region. Okay. More MSP can be awarded for those crops so that farmers they uh, naturally they divert. But quantity-wise, these will not be sustainable after all. Why it is? Okay, then what else? Anything else? So I'm able to... Uh... Okay, doesn't matter. So thank you, Mr. Tasha. We had a very nice discussion with you. Thank you.